Hello everyone, welcome back to Ancient Greece and Rome. This video will cover Unit 2, the First Greeks and Bronze and Dark Age Greece. In this video, we'll discuss some of the major Bronze Age Greek civilizations. We'll discuss the origins of the people that would become the Greek Bronze Age civilizations. Then we'll discuss some of the important characteristics of the Greek Bronze Age civilizations, like the Cycladic civilization, the Minoan civilization, and the Mycenaean civilization. We'll discuss their artifacts and some of their important cultural attributes. Then we'll close this video by discussing the Bronze Age collapse and how it affected these civilizations, specifically the Mycenaean civilization. We'll discuss what cultures emerged from the Bronze Age collapse during the so-called Greek Dark Age, and how the events of this period lead to the development of archaic Greece, which is a topic that we'll discuss in a future video. By the way, the image of this slide is a fresco from Crete depicting the lily prints a member of the elite class in the society of ancient Crete. Before we begin the archaeological and historical discussion of the founding of the Greek people, I want to briefly address the uh, mythological uh, beginning of the Greek people. Uh, the Greeks were said to be descended from a man named Helen, father of the Greek people. Um, this is in the English alphabet Helen with two L's, not one. Not to be confused with Helen, one L of Sparta or of Troy. Um, Helen was said to be the uh, son of Deucalion and Pyrrha, although some legends uh, say that he was the son of Zeus and Pyrrha, suggesting that the Greeks have divine ancestry. Of course, in actuality, uh, the Greek people were a mix of uh, Indo-European and indigenous Mediterranean, European, and Anatolian cultures that lived in Greece and in the uh, Aegean uh, and surrounding regions. Uh, the first Indo-European arrival in Greece is probably about the year 2500 BCE, although scholars will uh, debate these years somewhat. Uh, either way, they usually come out to a date in, in usually about the mid 2000s uh, BCE. Uh, so scholars also uh, have hypothesized that the uh, Dorian invasion of Greece that occurs about the year 1000 uh, BCE was actually a uh, second migration of Indo-European peoples, but we'll talk more about the Indo-Europeans and their migrations to Greece and their impact on the development of Greek culture uh, in a few minutes. Here we'll discuss the people who would come to be known as the Greeks. The Greeks were among the first Europeans to adopt agriculture during their Neolithic period, roughly 4000 BCE, due to their close proximity to Anatolia and Mesopotamia. Agriculture develops in Anatolia and Mesopotamia, and Greece was right across the Aegean Sea from these regions making the transfer of agriculture much easier. A series of cultural groups in the land that would become Greece created socioeconomic bases for the Bronze Age civilizations that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Those are the Cycladic, Minoan, and Mycenaean civilizations. These cultural groups, called the Eutrases, the Kara and the Karaku, from 3200 to 2650 BCE and 2650 to 2200 BCE, respectively, are also known as the Hellenic cultures. The Utrecht's culture is known for their pottery advancements and adoption of bronze. The Karaku are known for their building of large semi-monumental architecture, like the House of Tiles, which we'll look at later. Other cultures existed, but they'd be much less influential than the Cycladic culture, the Minoan culture, or the Mycenaean culture. 
Early Greek civilizations are known for their ceramics and their pottery, especially the Eutrazes. These early societies, like the Eutrazes and the Karaku, probably did not have their own writing systems, but later societies did, especially the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, who both developed their own scripts. The Minoans used a script called Linear A, the Mycenaeans used a script called Linear B. Some archaeologists think that early settlements founded by people like the Eutrazes and the Karaku would become the basis of larger settlements for the Minoan and Mycenaean civilizations, although there's some debate on this point. Now that we've discussed some of the cultures that were living in Greece in about the 3000s uh, BCE, I want to talk about the uh, Indo-European migrations to Greece. The Indo-European people were a uh, nomadic culture that lived in the uh, steppes or the plains of Central Europe, roughly what is now uh, Russia and the Ukraine, as you can see here. And there's several uh, migrations of Indo-European peoples out of uh, the steppe region uh, that take place over thousands of years. They go to places like Anatolia uh, in about the 4000s BCE, so about 1500 years before they uh, come to Greece, because scholars generally date the Indo-European arrival in Greece to about 2500 or so uh, BCE. Um, they also will migrate into uh, what is now Western Europe, uh, becoming uh, the ancestors of the uh, Celtic and Germanic and uh, Slavic peoples, um, all of whom speak uh, Indo-European languages, that is, languages that come from what is called Proto-Indo-European, what we think, the language we think these, uh, these Indo-European um, uh, migrants might have spoken. Um, the Indo-Europeans also uh, migrated to the east, into what is now uh, Iran. Uh, remember, uh, the Persians spoke an uh, Indo-European language, highlighting the Indo-European presence in places as far to the east as Persia. Uh, they also migrated down into what is now India, um, becoming part of uh, what is called the Vedic culture. Um, they also may have migrated as far uh, east into what is now Western China. Uh, on the term uh, Vedic culture, you may have also heard the term Aryan culture. Uh, in recent years, the term Vedic culture has become a lot more popular. Um, the term Aryan has uh, kind of fallen out of favor um, because of its popularity with uh, people in uh, 20th century Germany. Or, more technically, uh, pre-World War II Germany. Here's another helpful map of the uh, Indo-European migrations. You can see the Indo-European homeland is in uh, Central Europe, uh, extending eastward. Uh, you can see the various migrations. The earlier migrations um, were to places like Anatolia, either um, uh, from the west or from the east. And then um, the migrations to Greece kind of come sort of in the middle. Um, and then the later migrations are uh, to uh, what is now um, Asia what becomes Iran, what becomes India. Um, this map chooses to uh, refer to the uh, Vedic people as Aryans, which, um, as I said, uh, Aryans is a less, less popular term these days, but still accurate, still useful. What's interesting about this map is um, they refer to the Hittites as a non-Indo-European people. Non-Indo-European peoples are listed in gray. Indo-European people are listed in uh, black. Uh, generally speaking, scholars refer to the, uh, Indo the Hittites as being an Indo-European people, so it's a little bit unusual, but this map is still useful as it gives you an idea of um, where the Indo-European people were going and when, and then uh, what kind of cultures they helped to create uh, through their migrations. Another interesting thing to note about this map is that um, this map refers to the Assyrians as being a uh, Indo-European people, or rather an Indo-European group that um, joined with um, indigenous uh, Mesopotamian uh, groups to become uh, the Assyrians. We, of course, talked about the Assyrians in uh, a previous video. 
Assyrian culture had a lot of similarities with uh, Babylonian and other uh, Mesopotamian cultures, but it was also very, very warlike. Um, and we know that uh, Indo-European culture was very warlike, so perhaps the reason the Assyrians uh, were so much more warlike than other Mesopotamian civilizations is because of their um, relationships with the Indo-European peoples. And here is a map, a linguistic map of Indo-European languages. Um, as I mentioned on a previous slide, uh, Greek is a Indo-European language along with uh, the Slavic languages, the Germanic languages, and the Celtic languages. English, being that it comes from the Germanic languages, uh, is an Indo-European language technically. Uh, other Indo-European languages include um, Latin uh, or Italic, or the language that becomes Latin. Um, usually uh, linguists group um, Italic and Celtic together as coming from uh, the Proto-European Indo-European language kind of breaking off about the same time. Um, Greek, of course, uh, develops a little bit earlier. Um, also, keep in mind other languages that are of Indo-European origin are um, uh, the Persian languages. Uh, Persian is Indo-European language, as is uh, Sanskrit, uh, spoken, uh, what a language that was spoken in India. This small orange dot here, I believe, is meant to represent the uh, Hittite language. Now we should talk about who these Indo-European uh, migrants and invaders were. We generally think that the people who left uh, the Indo-European core in what is now um, Russia slash Ukraine were probably young men, young warriors from Indo-European society. Uh, they would have traveled on... Um, in groups called Koryos. Koryos were basically squadrons of uh, young warriors who left Indo-European society in order to gather fame and fortune for themselves and to conquer and uh, create their own uh, chiefdoms for themselves. And they would have done this in a variety of ways, uh, usually through warfare, but also perhaps through more peaceful migrations as well. It appears that these Indo-European migrations were more peaceful in some areas and more warlike in others based on archaeological evidence and um, uh, comparative ethnography, studying uh, different uh, later cultures that were impacted by uh, the European, Indo-European migrations. It can be difficult to study uh, the Indo-European migrations um, early on because the Indo-European people did not have a uh, written language. Instead, their descendants developed multiple different written languages um, in the places that they settled. Uh, the Indo-Europeans, of course, went to Greece and transformed Greek culture, and then the Greek uh, language um, was developed, and the Greek alphabet was developed based on the Phoenician alphabet. The Persians, um, who um, had Indo-European people in their past, the Persians adopted cuneiform as their written language. So uh, a lot of the sources we have are written much, much later, so we have to... Uh, study archaeology and, and study the various uh, cultures that were impacted by the Indo-Europeans. Now we'll discuss Indo-European weapons. Uh, the Indo-Europeans used uh, bronze weapons, uh, swords, daggers, spears, axes. They also used chariots as well um, for their highly mobile Koryos uh, raiding war, war parties. Uh, they often buried their dead with weapons, uh, suggesting they believe that you could take your weapons to the afterlife. Um, it was believed for many years that the Indo-Europeans were the ones who introduced uh, bronze working or technology to the Greeks. Uh, now we believe that the uh, people living in Greece already had uh, bronze making uh, technology, bronze working technology um, before the Indo-Europeans even arrived. This is a modern artist's uh, recreation of what a Indo-European chariot would have looked like. This chariot um, is being used by um, presumably Koryos warriors. Um, scholars believe that uh, cultures that have um, rites of passage for young male warriors probably got this tradition from the Indo-Europeans. For example, the Spartans had the uh, Cryptea, um, which they believe was a rite of passage, trial by fire for young uh, male Spartan warriors. It was sort of the final uh, stage of their military training. 
and that this Cryptea may have evolved from earlier Indo-European uh, Chorios um, parties. We'll talk more about the Cryptea later in this course. Here are some possible archaeological uh, portrayals of the Chorios. This first on the left is from the Yamnaya people. The Yamnaya people were Indo-European people that lived in what is now Russia, so a very early Indo-European culture. And then uh, on the center and the right is a, uh, a possible Greek portrayal of the uh, Chorios or of a young warrior um, entering a rite of passage. Uh, this, of course, is from Greece in the center. And then on the right, um, it's believed to be a, um, a statue of a young warrior um, from the Celtic tradition. Remember, the Greeks and the Celtic peoples um, had uh, Indo-Europeans in their uh, ancestry. Before we return to our discussion of the early Greek peoples of the Bronze Age, I want to make one more point about the Indo-European influence on uh, later Greek culture, and that is surrounding their uh, spirituality and their pantheon of gods. As I mentioned in a previous video, um, the ancient Greeks uh, learned elements of uh, their religion and spirituality from their neighbors, the Egyptians, and then their neighbors, the Mesopotamian peoples. They also learned uh, elements of their religion, their spirituality from the Indo-Europeans, we think as well, uh, specifically uh, the god Zeus, uh, the king of the gods, uh, the sky father of the uh, ancient Greek pantheon. Uh, Zeus bears many similarities to um, other Indo-European sky gods, um, like uh, Wotan of the Germanic peoples or Odin of the uh, Norse peoples. Zeus also has some similarities with uh, the Germanic slash uh, Scandinavian god Thor, uh, god of thunder. Uh, I would argue that Zeus has more in common with deities like Odin slash Wotan and Thor than he does with uh, Near Eastern and Egyptian sky gods like Amun of the uh, Egyptians or um, Anu of the uh, Mesopotamian peoples. Also, the uh, word Zeus might come from the uh, Proto-Indo-European -Europe uh, term uh, Deus uh, for God. Lastly, I think uh, Zeus's personality, as uh, described by uh, Greek mytho mythological authors like um, Homer or uh, Hesiod in particular, um, Zeus's personality is much more like that of a Odin or a Thor than it is uh, Anu or Amun. Zeus is much more unpredictable, uh, much more capricious um, than Amun and Anu were. Here's an illustration of the stratigraphy of Greece during the Hellenic periods. You have Hellenic I, which is lower than Hellenic II. An important trend across Greek history and an important part of Greek culture is seafaring. The Greek peninsula is very rugged, dominated by mountains, like Mount Olympus seen here. Mount Olympus was traditionally the home of the Greek pantheon. These mountains made agriculture difficult for the ancient Greeks. The mountains also made traversing Greece in the nearby regions by land very difficult. As such, for the ancient Greeks, it was much easier to travel long distances by sea, leading the Greeks, especially the Minoans, to become a seafaring civilization. We'll talk more about Greek seafaring in later videos. Here are some examples of early Greek pottery, specifically from the Eutrasis culture. You can see that the potters are beginning to experiment with ornamentation. Although the ornamentation is very much simpler than what we'll see in later periods of Greek ceramics. Pottery is an essential tool and technology for agricultural societies, as pottery is used to store harvested grains like wheat. Pottery keeps out the air, preventing oxidation. It keeps out water, preventing decomposition. It also can keep out pests like mice and rats. 
if the pottery is sealed with a lid of some kind. Pottery can also be used to store other liquid agricultural products like olive oil and wine. We'll talk more about olive oil and wine and their importance to Greek foodways and culture in a later video. Here's an image of the foundation of the heart house of tiles built by the Karakou people. It was built in the Peloponnesian region, which is the southern peninsula of Greece. Here you can see that it's a combination of materials, including bricks and stone. Unlike the ancient Near Eastern civilizations, which built much of their architecture out of mud bricks, the Greeks had access to a variety of materials, including bricks, but also wood and stone, allowing their architecture to be more diverse in terms of materials. Stone also is, preserves much better and leaves behind more evidence for archaeologists to investigate. Here's a partial reconstruction of the House of Tiles. It has its name because of its tile roof, showing that the Greeks were experimenting with ceramics, making not only pottery, but building materials as well. Tiles like these will be used in later periods as well. Here's an archeological plan of the House of Tiles site. As you can see, the site was inhabited through many different periods, including the Neolithic and then the Hellenic periods. The site also contains graves as well, shown here. We'll talk more about burial rituals amongst the Bronze Age Greeks later on in this video. Now we'll discuss the Cycladic civilization. Cycladic civilization was a seafaring civilization that inhabited the islands of the Aegean Sea from about 3200 to 2000 BCE. Although some archeologists think they may have inhabited these islands as late as 1000 BCE. The Cycladic civilization also had a presence on the Greek mainland as well. Archaeologists and scholars think the Cycladic civilization focused on seafaring, fishing, and trading. Perhaps their greatest cultural accomplishment are their figurines, seen here. Here are the Cycladic Islands, right in the middle of the Aegean Sea. In archaeology, just like real estate, we believe in the rule of location. Location, location, location. The Cycladic Islands, centered right in the middle of the Aegean Sea, would have given the people of the Cycladic civilization easy access to the Greek mainland, to Crete, and also to Asia Minor, facilitating their trade expeditions. Here are some examples of Cycladic figurines. Most of their figurines are fairly small, no more than a few feet high. Initial sculptures are very geometric, but they become rounder with time as the sculptor's techniques improved. Over time, anatomical features and clothing would become clearer. So seriation, as a form of relative dating, works well with the Cycladic figurines. Over time, the Cycladic sculptures made their images more anatomically correct. They also added clothing. We think these triangles represent loincloths, and we think this pattern here represents some kind of bandolier. The Cycladic civilization also made pottery. We call these examples of Cycladic pottery frying pans. You can see there's quite a bit of sophistication even from this early Greek civilization. These carvings are very intricate, and scholars think they may have some kind of symbolic meaning. Perhaps they represent the sun or waves of the sea, things that would have been very important to the Cycladic people. The decorations are very ornate. These vessels don't show any sign of being used for cooking. There's no signs of burning or carbon. We think they may have been ritual objects. Perhaps they held mirrors at some point. 
Here is an artistic recreation of what Cycladic people would have looked like. As you can see, they're using primitive bronze weapons. They've also decorated themselves with paint, drawing designs that are very similar to those found on the fry pans. We can also see some of their figurines here in the background. The artist who drew this image probably drew from images of the later Minoan civilization in order to create these people. Here are some views of cyclotic settlements in the Aegean Islands. As you can see, they're building out of stone and they're building separate buildings within their complexes, suggesting different spaces for work, sleep, leisure, and storage, or for separation of family units. We also see that their settlements have walls, implying they were possibly trying to keep foreign invaders, perhaps the Minoans, out. They may also have been trying to guard treasures they had gained during their trading expeditions, perhaps from pirates. Now we'll discuss the end of the Cyclotic Civilization. The Cyclotic Civilization seems to have begun to dissolve around 2000 BCE, losing much of its cultural influence. The Cyclotic Civilization was probably absorbed into the larger and more powerful Minoan culture. Some archaeologists think that a natural disaster, like a volcano, might have hastened the Cyclotic divide, decline as seen with many other ancient civilizations. Some archaeologists think that pockets of Cycladic culture may have existed as late as 1000 BCE. Now we'll shift gears and talk about the more well-known Minoan civilization. The Minoan civilization lasts from about 2200 to about 1450 BCE, although some scholars will debate these dates. The civilization has been named after their legendary King Minos, who we'll talk about later. Minos may actually have been their word for king or ruler. The Minoan civilization was centered on the island of Crete, but it was influential throughout the Aegean Islands and even on the Greek mainland. The Minoan civilization was documented by archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans from about 1900 to 1905 of the Common Era. You can see Evans at left. The Minoans, based on their archeological evidence, seem to have been a very wealthy civilization based around seafaring and trade. To facilitate their trade, the Minoans developed a writing system called Linear A, which as of yet has been untranslated. The Minoans are known for their palaces, like Gnosis, seen here at the right, and for their colorful frescoes. The Minoan civilization collapsed from a variety of factors. We think natural disasters played a role, but foreign invasions, possibly from the Mycenaeans, probably also destroyed their civilization as well. Here is a map of the Minoan trade networks, showing what products they bought and sold and where. As you can see, the Minoans may have traded with places as far flung as Spain on the far western coast of the Mediterranean. They are also trading heavily with Egypt and with the ancient Near East and of course with the Greek mainland. They may have even traded with the Italian peninsula as well. Here is a fresco showing Minoan seafaring. The fresco features a sailing vessel in the foreground and a harbor in the background, highlighting the importance of seafaring trade to the Minoans. Here are some images of Linear A. Archaeologists and philologists, people who study languages, are not sure if Linear A is an alphabet 
or if it's a writing system that combines pictograms with symbols that represent syllables. As of now, linear A remains undeciphered. But it does bear some similarities with linear B, the script used by the Mycenaeans. Linear B, by the way, has been translated. The Minoan civilization is known for its art, especially frescoes. Minoan two-dimensional art was dominated by frescoes. Frescoes are a type of painting that involves the decoration of wet plaster. They take their name from the Italian word fresco for fresh. Artists would paint their figures into the wet plaster. These pigments would dry with the plaster over time. And although some restoration has had to be done on the Minoan frescoes, they're remarkably well preserved because of this painting method. We can see that in the frescoes, the Minoan artists preferred to display their subjects from the profile perspective, much like the Egyptians suggesting a possible Egyptian influence. The human figures are stylized and triangular, like the Egyptians, although it's my personal opinion that the Minoans depicted their human subjects in a manner that's a little bit more anatomically correct. But what you see is the Minoans depicted their subjects, their human subjects, with very narrow waists, like the Egyptian art. So there's a cross-pollination of artistic traditions. Male subjects, men, are usually portrayed with darker skin than women. Men are portrayed here on the left. These two images are of frescoes of women on the right. The frescoes usually do not include inscriptions or captions. Even if they did, we probably wouldn't be able to read them because they'd be written in linear A. These frescoes give archaeologists important glimpses into everyday Minoan life, including their class and gender norms. As you can see, men are portrayed with darker skin, women are portrayed with lighter skin. This may show the Minoan civilization's preference for men working outdoors, developing tanner skin, while women work indoors with the family, showing that the Minoan civilization was more patriarchal than matriarchal. We also see class differences as well, particularly in how working class and upper class Minoans are attired, what kind of clothing they wear. We'll discuss that on another slide. For perspective, here are some shots of 2D Egyptian visual art. You can see the uh, similarities between Minoan and Egyptian visual art. Uh, the uh, image on the uh, the painting on the right hand side of the slide actually is of Minoan people visiting Egypt. Uh, you'll remember that uh, non-Egyptian people in Egyptian art are often portrayed wearing very colorful clothing. Uh, and the clothing that these workers are shown wearing is very similar to uh, the loincloths that uh, Minoan artists often portrayed their men wearing. By the way, the uh, Egyptians probably called the uh, Minoans the Keftiu, meaning the people of the islands in the middle of the sea, a reference to Crete and uh, surrounding islands. Remember, the Minoans probably did not actually call themselves Minoans. That was a term um, used by later archaeologists and scholars like Sir Arthur Evans. The Minoans uh, may have referred to themselves as the nail. Uh, the nail that holds everything together, uh, a reference to uh, Crete's sort of central location between Greece, Anatolia, and uh, Egypt and North Africa, and the fact that uh, the Minoans were uh, traders, and that they uh, engaged in manufacturing, and that they kind of did a little bit of everything in their culture. That is, trade, manufacturing, and agriculture. Here are some images of working class Minoans portrayed in fresco. Working class Minoans tended to wear simpler clothing than the elite Minoans did, but there were some similarities in how they dressed. Um, working class Minoans are usually shown completing some kind of work, like fishing, 
or picking saffron flowers, an important agricultural task. Both men and women of the working class seem to have worn some type of bluish-gray head covering that was probably woven, almost like a modern-day beanie. Perhaps this head covering had holes out of which the Minoans would put braids of their hair, or these could be some kind of decorative fabric added to these head coverings. We're just not sure. Once again, men are portrayed with a darker complexion, highlighting outdoor work. We also see continuities in how working class and upper class women dressed. Working class women's clothing tended to be a bit simpler, but like that of the upper class women, it tended to be very revealing. Um, the bust area and cleavage was exposed and the clothing overall tended to be very sexualized. Men wore small loincloths. Women wore clothing that was very revealing also. It also appears that women of all classes wore earrings of some kind. There's also evidence to suggest that Minoan women wore cosmetics. Here is an image of an upper class Minoan woman being attended by men of the working class. As you can see, her dress is very revealing and all the subjects are portrayed with very small waists. Here is a fresco of a working class Minoan harvesting saffron flowers while an upper class woman looks on. Here are some modern uh, recreations of uh, Minoan clothing. As you can see, uh, they are uh, very uh, revealing. Um, Minoan women's dresses, uh, the neckline is very low and uh, they seem to have some type of uh, built-in uh, corset here to um, make the waist look smaller. And of course, men's clothing is uh, quite revealing as well with these loincloths. Here are some uh, modern reenactors uh, portraying uh, Minoan women in their um, traditional garb, uh, performing some kind of uh, either ball dance or ball sport uh, that is portrayed um, in Minoan frescoes and visual art. Here are some figurines of Minoan women, which also can be used in addition to visual uh, 2D art to uh, recreate how uh, how women may have dressed in this society. Um, women are depicted prominently throughout Minoan art, as you've seen uh, so far in this uh, video. We believe this is because Minoan society was a lot less patriarchal and probably somewhat more matriarchal uh, than mainland Greek society or Mycenaean society um, that's around at about the same time as the Minoans. Of course, a patriarchal society is a society in which uh, men are in control and a matriarchal society is a society in which uh, women are in control. We think that, uh, relatively speaking, uh, Minoan society allowed women to have a lot more uh, control and, and power over things, particularly when it came to uh, religion and uh, spirituality, we think. Uh, on the right-hand side of the slide is a um, figurine of, we believe it's a Minoan snake goddess, a very important uh, deity in their uh, religious beliefs and their spirituality. Uh, this Minoan state goddess may have inspired uh, the later Greek mythical figure of Medusa. Because of their significant wealth, the Minoans had increased resource surpluses and thus increased divisions of labor. These surpluses and divisions would have allowed more time for leisure, entertainment, and sports. One activity depicted in the frescoes was bull leaping, seen here. Bull leaping may have been a sport, but it may have also had spiritual and religious connotations, which we'll discuss later. What's interesting is this fresco shows both women and men participating in bull leaping. The male figure, portrayed in red, leaps over the bull and is flanked by two women. Perhaps they're distracting the bull while the man leaps over or perhaps they're getting ready to leap over the bull themselves. 
we don't exactly know what the original artists intended with this fresco. Perhaps this is meant to be an action shot of some kind, or perhaps it's meant to be a progression, with one woman having leaped first, followed by the man, as another woman gets ready to leap. In a way, perhaps, it's an ancient comic strip. Here is a restoration, an enhancement of the bull leaping fresco. You can see that the male has the beginnings of a slight beard, which is somewhat unusual because Minoan males are usually portrayed clean shaven. The women wear similar garb to the male bull leaper, which once again suggests that they're not just in this image for show, they're here because women participated in bull leaping as well. The Minoans also enjoyed boxing. Boxing was a blood sport that could be bet on. Images of Minoan boxing often depict young boys fighting. It's possible that boxing may have been a form of military training as well for the Minoans. In addition to portraying people and activities, the Minoans also portrayed animals in their frescoes. This fresco shows dolphins and a variety of species of fish. And this piece of a fresco here shows pheasants, which would have been an important food source for the Minoans. Here's a partial reconstruction of the Palace of Gnosis with a fresco in colored columns. These are a series of aqueducts that would have uh, pumped fresh water into uh, the Palace of Gnosis, giving uh, the palace's uh, residents access to clean water, which they could use to uh, drink, um, to uh, prepare food, and of course to do things like uh, bathing and uh, for washing away uh, waste as well. This is a decorated Minoan bathtub. We believe that the Minoans put a lot of emphasis on cleanliness. Um, building uh, water pipes and aqueducts for their palaces, uh, keeping bathtubs uh, that could be uh, used for cleanliness and for cleaning. Uh, there's a lot of uh, material evidence for the uh, Minoan's emphasis on hygiene. This is a uh, toilet uh, at the Palace of Gnosis. Once again, fresh water uh, being brought in by pipes would be uh, used to uh, basically flush these toilets. Here is a model of a uh, Minoan floor heating system. Uh, it's very similar to uh, the later uh, Roman uh, hypocaust. Basically, um, fires, uh, wood burning uh, in the basement areas would heat the floors and then heat the entire palace. So the Minoans were developing very uh, sophisticated plumbing technology, but also uh, heating systems for their palaces as well. Here is an uh, example of what uh, this heating system might have looked like at Gnosis. Uh, in this area, um, there would be fires, and then the fires would uh, project heat upward, uh, heating the entire palace. The Palace of Gnosis, based on archaeological research, was a very large, impressive complex that was ornately decorated with frescoes and colored columns. Um, as you can see, it has a variety of chambers for different types of use. It features courts, halls, areas for performances, places where arms are stored, storage areas, and even places of burial. Visitors to the Palace of Gnosis would have been impressed with its size. They may have even been intimidated by its large collection of labyrinth-like rooms, but we'll discuss labyrinths more in a moment. Here are some artists' recreations of life at the Palace of Gnosis. Here's a representation of the lily prints seen at the beginning of this video. As you can see, life for the elite of the Minoan civilization was probably pretty good. 
but it was dependent upon the labor of the working lower classes and probably on slaves as well, seen here and here. Their labor would have kept the upper classes fed, allowing them to pursue things like entertainment. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, Minoan economy. As mentioned previously, the Minoan economy, at least the domestic Minoan economy, that is the economy centered on the island of Crete, uh, was a redistributive economy. It was not a market economy where people bought and sold freely. Uh, rather, uh, people would bring goods to the palace and then they would have those goods redistributed. Um, olive oil and wine and wheat, uh, saffron, metal goods even would be distributed. Uh, to the people, and then uh, the palace, uh, the king and uh, his administrators would keep a large portion for themselves to uh, fund the opulent, even hedonistic uh, lifestyle of the palaces. Outside of the island of Crete, though, uh, the Minoans had very extensive uh, trade networks and a maritime trade-based economy. Um, they would uh, buy and sell goods from across the Mediterranean basin, and the buying and selling of these goods made the Minoans uh, very very wealthy because they kept uh, these profits for themselves, of course. The Minoans, um, they exported a lot of goods, pottery, uh, metal goods, uh, agricultural products like saffron, uh, which is a very expensive spice. And the export of these goods also uh, would have made them wealthy, would have allowed them to have very good trade surpluses. They also imported goods uh, from other parts of the uh, Mediterranean world, uh, from Egypt from the Levantine coast, from Anatolia, and from mainland Greece. So uh, in addition to their redistributive economy on the island of Crete, the Minoans also had a, a very large um, foreign uh, trade-based economy as well that included uh, both imports and exports. And uh, these economic systems were greatly facilitated by the use of writing, uh, the, specifically the Minoans uh, Linear A script, which uh, has not been deciphered, but we believe would have been used uh, for trade purposes since um, writing systems have been used uh, for trade since uh, the development of the first scripts. Now we'll briefly discuss the legend of Theseus and the Minotaur, because I think it reveals how contemporary civilizations might have viewed the Minoans. Keep in mind, though, that the legend of Theseus and the Minotaur was recorded centuries after the Minoan civilization came to an end. For those of you that are not aware of the story, Theseus, Prince of Athens, kills the Minotaur, a bull man monster belonging to King Minos of Crete. Theseus accomplishes this with the help of Minos's daughter, Ariadne, shown here. The Minotaur lived in a labyrinth and consumed human prisoners. The large size of the Palace of Gnosis and bull leaping and the stratified nature of Minoan society, with the elite being dependent on the labor of the working class, may have also inspired this myth. The Minoan religion, which included elements of human sacrifice and worship of animal deities, may have also played into this story as well. Perhaps the Minotaur was not a monster, but a priest wearing a bull mask of some kind. This myth also reveals the tension between the Minoans and the Mycenaeans of the Greek mainland. Theseus was from Athens on the Greek mainland. Most of the images we have of Theseus and Ariadne are from centuries later. Here you can see a Greek image from centuries after the Minoans, and you can see later medieval and Renaissance era depictions of the myth. Considering the large uh, maze-like floor plan of the Palace of Gnosis, it's easy to see how um, the story of Theseus and the Labyrinth may have evolved. Uh, this legend may have been based on uh, mainland Greeks' visits to the Palace of Gnosis and seeing how large and maze-like and easy to get lost in the palace it was. Here are some artifacts to illustrate 
Minoan religion and spirituality. Based on the artifacts we have, archaeologists think that the Minoan religion was more pantheistic than the religion of the Greeks in later periods. Um, there's a possible Egyptian and Mesopotamian influence in the Minoan religion as a result of the trade relations between the Minoans, the Egyptians, and the people of the ancient Near East. Bulls seem to be sacred to the Minoans based on their depiction of bulls in their carvings, seen at right. Archaeologists also think the Minoans may have worshipped a mother goddess with snakes, seen here at left. Interestingly, the Minoans also allowed women to serve as priestesses, something that not all ancient civilizations permitted. In addition to their religion having uh, Mesopotamian and Egyptian influences, uh, the Minoan religion also seems to be more uh, matriarchal, uh, more matriarchal than the uh, religion of the mainland Greeks. It's believed that the most powerful deities in the uh, Minoan pantheon were goddesses, not gods. Uh, this slide shows a figurine of a Minoan earth goddess. Uh, earth is often portrayed as a, as a mother or as a woman. Also, uh, this figurine is wearing a cone-shaped headdress. We think that these cone-shaped headdresses may have been reserved for uh, Minoan priestesses. The Minoan burial rituals and tombs were fairly simple compared to those of the other civilizations we've discussed, especially the Egyptians. They built small stone tombs, seen here, and they interred their dead in decorated sarcophagi, like this example here. Their tombs are much less ornate than their palace, like at Knossos. Here's some additional information about uh, Minoan uh, tombs and uh, burial rituals. Um, Minoans also uh, buried their dead in the ground and then uh, in some cases would uh, exhume the uh, bones of their dead and place them in uh, ossuaries or bone boxes called uh, larnaxes. And an example of a larnax can be seen here. And this is what a larnax would look like uh, with human remains placed inside. Uh, this technique of uh, exhuming uh, human remains and then reburying them in a different location is called secondary burial. And it's believed that the uh, mainland Greeks practiced secondary burial during this period as well. Although later Greeks would not practice secondary burial. How did the Minoan civilization come to an end? Evidence suggests that the Minoan civilization collapsed as an independent entity between the years 1450 and 1200 BCE. The Santorini volcano further to the north in the Aegean Islands erupted around 1600 BCE and it may have caused flooding and earthquakes as far away as Crete, seen here on the right. Some scholars think that this natural disaster may have inspired the later legend of Atlantis. Volcanic ash from the Santorini volcano may have caused crop failures and famines as well. These cataclysmic events would have made it more difficult to fend off foreign evasions, especially from the Mycenaeans, who would have had a score to settle with the Minoans as shown by the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. There is evidence of a Mycenaean takeover by the 1200s BCE, in which the palace of Knossos was damaged. Now we'll discuss Mycenaean Greece, a civilization which lasted from about 1750 to 1050 BCE. Like the later Greek city-states, the Mycenaean Greeks were not united into a single empire. Rather, there were spheres of influence within Mycenaean Greece, one surrounding Mycenae, their most important city, 
but also one around what will become Sparta and will become Athens. Athens and Sparta were probably small settlements or villages at this point. Mycenae, by far, was their most important city. Here is a view of Mycenae's Lion Gate and the dry stone wall fortifications of this city. The Mycenaean civilization was centered on mainland Greece, and it was divided into smaller kingdoms, which we saw a moment ago. Mycenae was by far the most powerful. These principalities would evolve into the Greek city-states of the Archaic and Classical period. The Mycenaeans, architecturally speaking, are known for their tombs and their fortresses called citadels. Here's an image of the Citadel of Knossos, and here's an image of their Tholos tomb, also called a beehive tomb because of its round shape. The Mycenaeans produce some artwork, including frescoes, but they're best known for their burial masks, which are very unique and ornate. The Mycenaeans frescoes are not nearly as good as those of the Minoans. The Mycenaeans were also far more warlike than the Minoans were. The Mycenaeans used bronze weapons to attack rival fortresses and citadels like Troy, as described in the Homeric epics. The Mycenaean civilization collapsed around the 1000s BCE after an invasion from the iron-using people called the Dorians. The most important archaeologist to investigate the Mycenaean civilization was Heinrich Schliemann, shown here on the right, who investigated the civilization in the 1870s. Schliemann was a very controversial figure within the history of archaeology, and you'll see why later. Here is a view of Linear B, the Mycenaean script. Symbolically, it looks a lot like Linear A, but scholars have actually been able to translate Linear B, something they've failed to do for Linear A. Here is a view of the Mycenae archeological site. As you can see, the Mycenaean Greeks used a lot more stone than the civilizations of the ancient Near East. They used a variety of different types of stone masonry as well. They used large stones arranged using dry stone masonry to create their walls, and they used smaller stonework to create interior buildings. Here is a view of the exterior walls of Mycenae, as well as a view of its famous Lion Gate. Because of how militaristic their civilization was, the Mycenaeans would have needed to guard their citadels, and walls would have been the best way of accomplishing this. On the whole, Mycenaean architecture is plainer than that of the Minoan culture, reflecting the more militaristic and war-like nature of the Mycenaean society. They built dry stone walls, they used different types of masonry, but they did make some elaborate gates, like the Lion Gate. Um, lions represented military strength and royalty in the ancient Mediterranean and ancient Near East. The Mycenaeans made frescoes as well, but they're not of the same quality as those made by the Minoans, as you'll see soon. Here is a uh, modern artist's rendering of what a uh, Mycenaean citadel would have looked like. As you can see, the citadel is surrounded by uh, Cyclopean masonry walls. These are dry stone walls with, made of very large stones. Um, the Greeks, uh, looking back at uh, Mycenaean ruins centuries later, theorized that these uh, ruins um, had been built by a species of Cyclops, uh, you know, one-eyed monsters that were much stronger than humans that could move these uh, large stones into place and fit them together without mortar because they are uh, dry stone um, masonry. As you can see, the citadel is uh, built on a hill. 
uh, to give uh, the uh, residents of the citadel um, a line of sight and an easier defense. The Mycenaean uh, city-states were much more in danger of being attacked from the land than uh, the Minoan palaces were, so they are much more uh, fortified than the Minoan palaces. Now we'll discuss some of the uh, architectural features of these Mycenaean uh, citadels. Uh, the Mycenaeans also had um, water uh, delivery systems in their citadels, although their systems generally are a lot less uh, architecturally sophisticated than those of the Minoans. Um, they have some pipe and drainage systems, but they don't have these aqueducts that bring fresh water in from elsewhere. Instead, uh, the Mycenaeans uh, relied on a series of uh, cisterns. These cisterns, of course, would have collected water um, from the rains, and this would have given uh, the Mycenaeans a water supply that they could have drawn from during long sieges. Uh, the Minoan style of aqueducts actually are very vulnerable to attacks from enemies. The first thing an enemy would do would be uh, cut off uh, the city they're attacking's water supply. But if the city is relying on cisterns, then they'll be able to uh, survive a siege for a lot longer. So the Mycenaeans' uh, architectural choices reflect their more militaristic society, their society that's focused on warfare and um, defending their uh, their settlements, their citadels. This is the cistern of Mycenae. The uh, water doesn't look very appetizing, but the cistern does its job of providing water uh, during sieges. The Mycenaeans also uh, centered their citadels around the Great Hall or Megaron. Uh, the Megaron was a gathering place where uh, elite and working class Mycenaeans would come together um, to petition their kings and to have goods redistributed. Uh, the Mycenaeans, we think, had a redistributive economy just like uh, the Minoans did. That is, uh, people in the countryside would bring their produce to the citadel and then the kings and their uh, administrators would divide the goods between the people. And of course, uh, the kings and their administrators would keep a lot of those goods for themselves. The Minoans took those goods and used them to make large palaces and to put on sporting events and things like that. The Mycenaeans, however, took goods and uh, kept them to sustain their militaries. And of course, there's an Indo-European influence in these great halls as well. A lot of Indo-European uh, cultures will have uh, great halls where uh, leaders will gather with their people. And a lot of these great halls uh, will be centered on a, a hearth of some kind, which provides warmth but also can be used for uh, cooking as well and you can see the uh, great the great hearth of this great hall here this is the floor plan of a mega rod or great hall um, there's a series of columns uh, holding up the roof uh, there's a vestibule where people wait before going into the uh, main part of the great hall and of course there is uh, a hearth in uh, the center of the, uh, the throne room of the mega rod and this is an artist's recreation of what a uh, Megaron may, may have looked like. Notice the columns, notice the hearth. There's also decorations on the columns and throughout the, uh, the building. The Mycenaeans were generally less interested in visual art than uh, the Minoans were, but they still made uh, visual art just in their own uh, style. It was inspired by the Minoans, but had some key differences as well. Here is a modern reconstruction of a Megaron, complete with uh, a throne where the uh, king would sit. This is the uh, excavated foundation of the Megaron at uh, Pylos. Or Pylos. Um, it's believed to be the uh, great hall of the legendary Greek king Nestor, who is mentioned in uh, the Odyssey. Now that we've discussed uh, Mycenaean architecture and uh, the structure of Mycenaean society, we can discuss Mycenaean religion. Uh, the Mycenaeans had temples in their citadels, and at their temples they worshipped, uh, we think, early versions of later Greek deities, uh, including Zeus and Hera. Zeus, of course, is uh, the god of thunder and lightning. He's the king of the gods. Uh, there's a strong Indo-European influence uh, in the creation of Zeus. Uh, we think the Mycenaeans also worshipped Hera. Uh, 
queen of the gods, wife and consort to Zeus. Uh, they probably also worshipped a version of Poseidon, the god of the sea. This makes sense because the Greeks are a uh, maritime seafaring culture. They would want to worship a, a god of the sea to protect their shipping and to prevent storms and to have favorable winds. Um, they also likely worshipped Artemis, a version of Artemis, goddess of the hunt. Uh, hunting would have been very important in uh, Mycenaean society. It would have been a uh, source of food, but also a uh, sport and form of entertainment, particularly for uh, wealthy people, elite people in Mycenaean society. Uh, we also think the Mycenaeans worshipped slash feared uh, human animal hybrids um, called uh, daemons. Uh, it's possible these daemons would inspire uh, later uh, Greek spiritual figures like Pan, for example, who had the physical features of both a human and a goat. Uh, we think the Mycenaeans had priestesses in their religion, but on the whole, their religion appears to be a lot more patriarchal. And it seems to be more Indo-European in its uh, flavor than the religion of uh, the Minoans. Um, the Minoan religion is arguably much more influenced by Egyptian and uh, ancient Near Eastern uh, spirituality. This is a uh, Mycenaean fresco of either a priestess making an offering of grain or perhaps of uh, the goddess Demeter. Uh, Demeter was the uh, Greek goddess of agriculture. Here are some uh, Mycenaean religious artifacts. On the left is a uh, bronze figurine of a male, believed to possibly be Zeus because of the posture of the arm. Perhaps the arm is casting a uh, lightning bolt, throwing a lightning bolt the way Zeus would have done. On uh, the uh, right hand side is a figurine believed to be of a, uh, a woman, of a female, either a female goddess or perhaps a priestess. Uh, we don't know for sure because we have not found uh, inscriptions telling us what these figurines were. Here are some images of Mycenaean frescoes. As you can see, they're not as detailed or intricate as the Minoan frescoes. Women, when they're portrayed in Mycenaean frescoes, are portrayed with a lot more clothing and in a less sexual manner. They're also portrayed as not being as slender in Mycenaean frescoes, possibly to reflect the more warlike nature of the Mycenaean society. The Mycenaeans may have been emphasizing fertility over sexuality, or they may have been trying to show their women as being more muscular. Overall, though, the skill of the Mycenaean fresco artist seems to be lower. Even though these frescoes are generally newer than the ones made by the Minoans. So seriation would not work as a form of relative dating when dating frescoes of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. Here is a reconstructed uh, fresco of Mycenaean women from Thebes. As you can see, uh, there is a Minoan influence in Mycenaean uh, 2D art and frescoes, but there are some slight differences as well. Uh, the women are portrayed in a little bit less revealing of a manner, and they're also portrayed uh, with a little bit more uh, full figures. Here is an example of a chariot scene displayed in a Mycenaean fresco. You'll see that the Mycenaean fresco artists depicted their males with darker skin, just like the Minoans did. Here you can see the chariot made of bronze, and you can see the helmets they're wearing as well. These helmets were usually made of pieces of boar tusk. Another example of uh, Mycenaean frescoes of men, uh, instead of being portrayed uh, jumping bulls or playing sports or fishing, uh, Mycenaean uh, males are portrayed in combat, reflecting the uh, militaristic nature of Mycenaean society. Here are some images of Mycenaean arms and weapons. Um, the images at the top were found in a Mycenaean tomb, and then the figure on the right is wearing a modern-day reproduction of bronze Mycenaean armor. The Mycenaeans primarily used bronze weapons, especially melee weapons like swords and spears. Kings and officers, the members of the elite classes, would have worn heavy bronze armor and a boar tusk helmet. 
as seen on the model on the left hand side of the slide. They also would have worn crests on the top of their helmets. These crests would have made the wearers look taller and more intimidating, but they may have been a way to indicate rank as well. Enlisted warriors from the working classes probably did not wear armor like this. They probably only wore a much simpler boar tusk helmet, and they might have had a shield made from leather and wood. Mycenaean warfare, because of its reliance on expensive bronze weapons, could have only worked in a stratified society with a wealthy and well-armed and well-armored protected elite class, and then large numbers of lower class recruits to serve as cannon fodder, or in ancient times, catapult fodder. Here's a vase from Athens showing Mycenaean warriors. You can see the boar tusk helmets, their spears, and then their shields and arm in basic armor. These may be warriors from the upper class based on their attire. Here are some modern artistic recreations of Mycenaean warriors. As you can see, the warriors of the elite class with their crested helmets and their bronze armor are much better protected than their working class subalterns who just have helmets and shields. The Mycenaeans also used chariots as well, like the Egyptians in the ancient Near Eastern civilizations. With this background about Mycenaean warfare and weapons in mind, we can discuss the Trojan War. The Trojan War, as a historical event, took place sometime between 1260 and 1180 BCE. Most of our knowledge of the Trojan War is mixed with a significant amount of legend and myth created by the epic poem Homer, who developed his story of the Trojan War called the Iliad between the 900s and the 600s BCE, somewhere in that period. By the 1800s of the Common Era, historians and early archeologists had begun to believe that the Trojan War and even Troy itself might have been fiction. Heinrich Schliemann, discussed before, did not believe this and set out to prove that Troy and the Trojan War were real. He did this by investigating and excavating at the fortress of Hisarluk. Hisar, by the way, is the Turkish word for fortress. The site technically is a tell with multiple layers of strata. Working quickly, and rather carelessly, Schleiman used tools and dynamite to blast his way into the tell to find evidence of the city of Troy. The city of Troy was probably called Taroisa or Walusa by the Hittites, which may have inspired the Greek words for the city, Troy or Ilion. The Trojans were probably not Hittites, but they were probably not Greeks as well. They were probably called the Asua, perhaps the root word for our modern word Asia. Once again, scholars debate these names. Troy as a settlement was founded probably around the year 3600 BCE, and it was inhabited as late as the year 500 CE. Strata layers 6 through 7a showed evidence of warfare, fire, demolished buildings, and exposed human remains, evidence for a possible war. These layers of strata, relatively speaking, are also dated to about the same time that the historical Trojan War would have taken place, the 1260s to 1180s BCE. Here are some scenes from the Trojan War. The Trojan War, according to Homer's myth, was fought over Helen of Sparta, who was betrothed to be married to Menelaus, king of Sparta. Paris, the prince of Troy, kidnaps Helen with the help of the goddess 
Aphrodite. There's some debate over whether Helen went with Paris willingly or not. Here's some scenes from the war itself. Homer depicts the war as being highly destructive and fratricidal, with the Greeks fighting the Trojans for over 10 years. Important Greek heroes like Achilles fight in the war and ultimately are killed. The Trojan War ends when the Greeks build a horse, which they use to get inside the city. Then they open the gates to let their comrades in, and they destroy, destroy the city, putting its residents to the sword. I mentioned the Trojan War and its causes, the kidnapping of Helen, because some historians from the period, including Herodotus, mentioned that the kidnapping of women was very common in the ancient Aegean. Here is a map of the factions that took part in the Trojan War. Once again, highlighting that the Greeks were not a unified empire or unified under one government at this time, yet they had a strong sense of identity. Even as a separate confederation of city-states and principalities. The sacrifice of Iphigenia or Iphigenia was said to have taken place at the beginning of the Trojan War. Agamemnon, king of Mycenae and leader of the uh, Greek or Achaean coalition, Achaean is the term that Homer uses to describe uh, the Greeks in uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. He had offended the uh, goddess Artemis by killing a sacred stag and in order to um, make Artemis happy again, he decided to sacrifice his daughter to her. Uh, there's many versions of the story. Um, Artemis supposedly had given the Greeks unfavorable winds, preventing them from sailing to Troy, and uh, Agamemnon needed to uh, placate Artemis if the Greeks were to go to Troy uh, by ship and to be successful. Uh, some versions of the story have uh, Iphigenia not being sacrificed at the last minute, surviving, Others have her being rescued by Artemis. Uh, either way, what you see in these stories is that the uh, ancient Greeks were aware of human sacrifice and that occasionally their leaders engaged in human sacrifice, but it was considered to be a very uh, dishonorable thing to do, a very desperate thing to do, not something that you did lightly and not a good thing. Uh, Agamemnon, for uh, sacrificing his daughter, is actually going to be killed by his wife, Clytemnestra. There is some uh, historical and archeological evidence for um, the ancient Greeks or the Bronze Age Greeks practicing human sacrifice. This is the uh, skull of Chania found on the island of Crete. It dates to about the 1280s uh, BCE. This is during the uh, Mycenaeans rule of Crete after the Minoan civilization had basically collapsed. Um, archeologists and uh, other scholars believe that this skull belonged to a sacrificial victim. Uh, this skull would have come from probably about an eight-year-old girl um, who's died from a very traumatic blow to the head. Not the sort of thing that would happen typically by accident, leading some to think that she had been uh, sacrificed, killed with a blow to the head. Also, the fact that the, uh, the body, the remains were found with animal bones, possibly as animals that were sacrificed, lead uh, archaeologists to think that this was uh, evidence of sacrifice amongst the of humans amongst the Bronze Age Greeks. And uh, based on this site, based on um, the state of these remains, it's very easy to see why the ancient Greeks saw human sacrifice as a barbaric practice. One, you're uh, murdering another human being to placate the gods, and two, the uh, ritual of, of bludgeoning someone in the head to kill them certainly is uh, a very bloody thing. Uh, with this discussion about human sacrifice out of the way, We'll continue our discussion of uh, the Trojan War and uh, historical and archaeological evidence for this uh, conflict. From an archaeological perspective, the Trojan War may also have taken place because Troy was in a very strategic location, close to the Dardanelles, also known as the Hellespont. This is a very strategic location nowadays, 
near the modern city of Istanbul, also known as Constantinople. Whoever controlled this strip of land could have controlled the Hellespont and thus would have had very easy trade access to both Europe and Asia. As I mentioned before, this is a very strategic part of the world even today. Not so much because of trade, but because of access between the Aegean and the Black Sea. These are some illustrations of the layers of strata and human development at the Troy slash Hisarluk site. Archaeologists think that the Trojan War would have taken place in layers Troy 6 and Troy 7A, shown here at the top. Here's an artist's recreation of what each of the layers would have looked like. As you can see, Troy evolves from a small settlement into a much larger city over time. The image on the left-hand side of this slide shows the various layers of strata at the Troy site. Here you can see Roman numeral three for Troy three and Roman numeral four for Troy four. You can also see Troy two down lower because it's an older layer. Here is a map of the ruins of Troy with the various layers marked in color. As you can see, the Trojan War would have taken place somewhere towards the end of Troy 6 and during Troy 7A. This map also shows that Troy was inhabited for centuries after the destruction of Troy during the Trojan War. We can see a theater and baths from the Roman period. Here are some archaeological reconstructions of the foundations of some of the buildings at Troy. As you can see, the Trojans used a variety of stone masonry to build their buildings, similar to the Mycenaeans, suggesting a sharing of ideas as well. This marble building over here seems to have a Near Eastern or Mesopotamian influence, suggesting they were taking ideas from the East as well as the West. Here's an artist's rendering of what Troy may have looked like at about the time of the Trojan War. We can see the vivid colors of the buildings, perhaps inspired by the Minoans, but there also seems to be a near influ Eastern influence in the architecture as well, as I described on a previous slide. Once again, this is an artist's rendering. It's an estimate of what the city may have looked like. Now we'll discuss a little bit of information about the excavation of Troy and why Heinrich Schliemann is a very controversial figure in archeological history. As I mentioned before, Schleiman investigated the Troy slash Hisarluk site because he wanted to prove the validity of the Homeric myths, specifically the Iliad. From 1871 to 1875 of the Common Era, Schleiman and his team worked very quickly and carelessly, even using dynamite to blast through the layers of strata to get to the level where they thought that the Troy of the Trojan War would be. Keep in mind that the field of archaeology was still professionalizing at this time, so things like this were a little bit more imaginable. Still, Schleiman's activities never escalated to the level seen in the Indiana Jones films or similar media. Schleiman found many valuable artifacts, including gold and silver, jewelry, which he then smuggled out of Turkey and took back to Greece. Turkey at the time was ruled by the Ottoman Empire but Greece was not. Here are some of the artifacts found by Schleiman and his team at Troy. They recovered many artifacts, you know, simple things like pots, but they also recovered very expensive jewelry, what was labeled Priam's treasure. 
Priam was the king of Troy at the time of the Trojan War, according to the Homeric myths. Here you can see Schleiman's wife, Sophia, modeling some of the jewelry. By the way, Schleiman's wife was Greek. More recent archaeologists argue that Schleiman may have mixed periods of strata, probably because he used dynamite, and some of the artifacts he found may be older than Troy VI. This is, of course, why professional archaeologists don't use dynamite when they're excavating an archaeological site, why they work very carefully and painstakingly. Now that we've discussed the Trojan War, we should talk about Mycenaean burial rituals and tombs. The Mycenaean upper classes would have had their remains interred in Tholos tombs. These were large monumental tombs shaped like beehives and made out of earth and masonry. While these tombs are large enough to be considered monumental, they're much smaller than the pyramids or the tombs of the Valley of the Kings. In general, the ancient Greeks did not spend as much time building large tombs for themselves as other civilizations did. But the Mycenaeans are a little bit of an exception. Their upper class built tombs that are somewhat large, but still nothing compared to what the Egyptians were doing. Here's an interior view of the Tholos tomb. As you can see from the bricks, they're parallel with the ground. This is a corbel dome. It's not a true architectural dome uh, because these bricks are parallel with the ground. It's still very architecturally impressive, though. Some archaeologists think that the walls of these tombs may have been covered with pure gold, although we don't know that for sure. And most of the Tholos tombs were robbed not long after their construction. Here's an example of a smaller Tholos tomb. This is another image of a Tholos tomb with a human here to show the scale of these tombs. They're very large, but they're not nearly as large as the pyramids or the tombs of the Valley of the Kings. In terms of burial customs, the Mycenaeans are most known for their death masks made of gold or other metals. Perhaps the most exemplary death mask is the gold mask of Agamemnon found by Heinrich Schliemann in 1876. This mask is actually from the 1600s BCE, about 400 years too early to be from Agamemnon. These masks could also be made with less detail, like this one in the center, or they can be with cheaper materials, like bronze. Wealthy Mycenaeans had their bodies buried with gold and other grave goods, including weapons, highlighting the militarism of their culture. Their decision to bury their dead with goods also highlights the Mycenaeans, one, believed in an afterlife, and two, they believed that physical goods could be taken to the realm of the dead. We'll talk more about evolving Greek beliefs about death and the afterlife in future videos. Now we must talk about the end of the Mycenaean civilization. Around the year 1050 BCE, a people called the Dorians invaded slash migrated to Mycenaean territory in the Peloponnesian and Attic peninsulas. Archaeologists debate the origin of the Dorians. Originally, it was thought the Dorians were from northern Europe and migrated southward, and that they were an equestrian people that rode horses and were armed with lances and iron weapons. More recent scholarship suggests the Dorians may have been an Asiatic people from Asia Minor who came to Greece via ships. Perhaps the Dorians were part of the Sea Peoples who invaded and attacked Egypt, as discussed in a previous video. The Mycenaeans may have been too weak to resist the Dorians due to previous military conflicts like the Trojan War. In addition, 
poor and oppressed everyday Mycenaeans might have refused to fight for their kings. They may have even regarded the Dorians as liberators. The period in Greek history from the end of Mycenaean rule to the beginning of the Archaic period has been called the Dark Age. This period lasted from about 1050 BCE to the 800s BCE. There's very little monumental archeological evidence to be found during this period. Here are some images of what the Dorians may have looked like. The left, which is a piece of ancient Greek ceramics, suggests the Dorians may have been cavalry from Northern Europe. The right shows they may have been a seafaring people, perhaps the sea peoples that we discussed in previous lectures. Either way, the Dorians helped bring an end to the Mycenaean civilization. Now we should discuss the Greek Dark Age, so-called. Was it really a Dark Age? This period, from about 1050 into the 800s BCE, was certainly chaotic. It was part of the Bronze Age collapse experienced across the Near East in which many civilizations struggled or collapsed. New military technology, including iron weapons and lances and mounted cavalry, may have helped the Dorians collapse the Mycenaean civilization. Previous civilizations in the ancient Near East and Greece had relied on chariots, but men mounted on larger horses would have been much more maneuverable and also much cheaper to maintain in the field than multiple horses pulling one chariot. The chaos of this period may have inspired Homer's epic poems, like the Iliad and the Odyssey. Greek polytheism, as we know it, probably emerged during this so-called Dark Age as well. The instability on the Greek mainland would have inspired the creation of Greek colonies, settlements across the Mediterranean basin. This probably occurred around the 900s BCE. And the Greeks in the setup of these settlements would have spread their culture throughout the Mediterranean, throughout North Africa, the Black Sea, and even as far as Italy, the southern coast of what is now France and Spain as well. During this period, the Greeks moved away from the Mycenaean Linear B writing system and developed the Greek alphabet, which is still in use today and has formed the basis for many other alphabets, including the Roman alphabet, which we use in English. As such, it's probably best not to call this period the Dark Ages, just because we don't know very much about it. It's not necessarily a bad time in Greek history. It's best to probably refer to this period as the early Iron Age or the pre-archaic period. Now we'll look at some Iron Age and uh, pre-archaic uh, Greek art. A lot of the art in uh, this period is called geometric art leading some uh, scholars to call the uh, Greek Dark Age, so-called the uh, geometric period. And you can see the very clear uh, geometric patterns on uh, these examples of uh, Greek pottery from the period. Here's another example of uh, Greek uh, geometric period pottery. You can see the uh, human figures are um, very simple. Uh, consisting of uh, triangles and uh, circles. Uh, there is some slight similarity to the older uh, Minoan and Mycenaean art in the sense that the uh, these human figures have very narrow waists, but uh, as you can see, it's uh, very different than uh, the art from earlier periods. They're very focused on uh, geometric patterns. Also, you can see uh, scenes from warfare here uh, on the bottom section of this uh, piece of pottery. There's uh, chariots and uh, soldiers bearing shields as well.
Here are some uh, geometric bronze figurines. Uh, this is a uh, centaur shown here. The centaurs were uh, half human, half horse. And here is a horse figurine. Horses, of course, would have been very valuable to uh, the Greeks um, really throughout their entire history. Horses are a form of transportation. Uh, they are used in warfare. Uh, they can pull chariots. They can be ridden into combat. Uh, horses also can be used to pull plows uh, for agriculture, a very valuable uh, commodity. So it's not surprising that horses show up in a variety of types of Greek art. By the way, uh, these uh, figurines come from the 8th century BCE. So towards the end of the uh, Greek Dark Age and at sort of the beginning of the Greek Archaic period. And uh, both of these pieces also are um, housed at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in uh, New York City. Conclusion. The Bronze Age and early Iron Age Greek civilizations shared some important similarities, but also some important differences as well. They used an Indo-European language that would evolve into Greek. They also used writing systems, linear A, linear B, and then the Greek alphabet that we know today. During this period, the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age, there was trade of both goods and ideas. Trade by sea and travel by sea would become a defining part of Greek culture. We also saw that some of these societies, especially the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, were very stratified with a large working and peasant class providing labor and food for a much smaller elite class. We see the Greeks' preference for stone architecture in the construction of their palaces and citadels and tombs. We also see an influence of Near Eastern artwork and North African artwork in the art of the Greek cultures during this period. The Greeks buried their bodies rather than cremating or mummifying them. They buried them in tombs that were much smaller than those used by the Egyptians, called tholos tombs. Warfare was a major part of life during the Bronze Age and early, Ice Age, early Iron Age. As seen during the Mycenaean invasion of Crete, the Trojan War, and the Dorian invasion. The Greek alphabet colonization and Greek epic poetry, as seen by the work of Homer, emerged as a result of these cultural patterns during the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. While not unified under a single government or empire, the Greeks developed a strong cultural identity as a result of their ancestors' achievements and trials during the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. We'll talk more about how these developments influenced Greek civilization in later videos.